In the next two chapters, we focus particularly on transaction risk and how organizations can control it. We start off by recapping some of the theory around exchange rates, explaining how they are quoted and what they are. And we're going to look at some of the theory behind why exchange rates move, why spot rates move, looking at purchasing power parity and interest rate parity that are two theories dealing with this. You may recall these from your economic studies. We'll then move on to look at how transaction risk can be controlled, different things organizations can do to mitigate it. There are a number of things that organizations can do when they operate internally. In other words, they can do for themselves without involving outside parties. For example, they might invoice in their own or another stable currency. They can manage the timing of the payments to avoid transaction risk and so forth. Do have a think about whether these are appropriate for any, any organization you're looking at in a scenario in the exam. We'll then move on to look at some of the external techniques organizations can use. In other words, those that involve others. And there are four techniques that are examinable numerically in this paper. We'll look at two in this chapter. We'll look at forward contracts, which you've already come across as a concept. We'll see how that applies to currencies. And also the money market hedge, which is a sort of do-it-yourself forward. It's a way of mimicking the action of a forward contract through a series of transactions you set up with your bank. In the following chapter, we'll look at futures and options, which are some of the derivatives that companies can use to manage their currency risk. Now, before we get into the detail on this, it's important to introduce some terminology and conventions around exchange rates and how we express them and how we talk about them. So, just to define what an exchange rate is, it tells us how many units of one currency can be bought or sold for another currency. It may seem like an obvious point, but the price of a currency can only be expressed in terms of another currency. There's two very important terms introduced in the following paragraph. The rate for immediate delivery of a foreign currency is called the spot rate. When people talk about the spot rate, they mean what is the price of another currency now if I want to buy it or sell it now. The forward rate is the term that is used for the rate that is quoted for future delivery of a currency. So if I want currency to be delivered in three months time, let's say, I would be quoted a forward rate for that. Now it's possible that you may see exchange rate tables, like the one we've extracted here, which allows you to read off the price of one currency in terms of another. The terminology that's used here is firstly, you can have a direct quote. And a direct quote is the no amount of currency to buy one unit of foreign currency. So if we look on our table here, and we're looking at the, uh, the dollar sterling rate, then we can see that one dollar costs 0.593 pounds. So one dollar equals 0.593 pounds. That is, as far as we're concerned, our direct quote. If we are based in the UK, as far as we're concerned, it's going to cost us 59.3p to buy one dollar. The indirect quote is how much of the overseas currency is required to buy a unit of our own currency. So taking the same two currencies, the dollar uh, is 1.685 to buy one pound. So 1.685 dollars will buy one pound. Now what you tend to find is that for sterling quotations, quotes are usually indirect. But for other currencies, quite often they are direct. And those of you who are very hot on your maths would have spotted that these two rates are the reciprocals of each other. They kind of have to be because you're expressing the same number different way around. So what that means is that 1 over 1.685 equals 0.593. And that must follow if 1.685 dollars equals 1 pound, then 1 dollar equals 0.593 pounds. Now one topic that's occasionally come up in this paper is that of cross rates. And what cross rates are about is calculating rates that you haven't been given. So the papers will by no means publish all of the exchange rates against each other. 
But if you have the exchange rate of two different currencies against a third currency, you can calculate the cross rate. So let's use a numerical example to show what we mean. So we're talking now about the Singapore dollar and the Australian dollar. And we have the rate between the US dollar and both the Singapore dollar and the Australian dollar. We're then asked to calculate the Singapore dollar to Australian dollar cross rate. Now bear in mind that under the convention adopted by SEMA, if we're talking about the Singapore dollar to Australian dollar cross rate, what we mean is one Singapore dollar equals how many Australian dollar. So how many Australian dollars are there for each Singapore dollar? To work that out, we need to do a bit of maths. And the way that we're going to work this out is by saying, OK, if we can work out the number of Australian dollars to the US dollar and multiply that by the number of US dollars to the Singapore dollar, then the way the maths works, we're going to eliminate the US dollar amount in each case and we are going to end up with the number of Australian dollars per Singapore dollar, which is what we're looking for. Now in this example, there are 1.422 Australian dollars for every one US dollar and there is one US dollar to every 1.737 Singapore dollars. Now if we multiply those by each other, we end up with 1.4 divided by 1.737. We work that one out, it works out as being 0.819. So what we can say is that one Singapore dollar equals 0.819 Australian dollars. And we can work out the rate between the two. Now the following point is very important and does trip some people up, so make sure you get it straight in your mind before we go further with exchange rates. If you go into a bank to convert one currency into another, let's say I'm going on holiday to the US, and I go into the bank to sell my sterling and buy US dollars. I ask the bank, what's the price between sterling and US dollars? They're going to ask me, am I buying or selling? Because what the banks will do is they will give you a different rate according to whether you are buying the currency or selling the currency and the spread between the two is how they make their money. So if, for example, you saw in the press a quote like this, for bid offer spread, what that means is the quotation is one pound to 1.6845 to 1.6855 US dollars. Now what you may need to do if you're working through a foreign exchange calculation is to decide which of those rates to use. SEMA don't always make you decide, but they sometimes do. The way I find it easiest to remember this is to think, well, OK, given the transaction I'm making, which way round is going to make the bank better off and me worse off? So let's say, for example, I am buying US dollars and I am selling pounds. So if I'm going to the bank and I'm selling my pounds and I'm buying US dollars, the question to ask is, is the bank going to give me $1.6845 for each of my pounds or are they going to give me $1.6855 for each of my pounds? Now if you can frame the question like that you can answer it. The bank is going to do whatever is best for them so the bank is going to give me $1.6845 for each of my pounds so that's the rate I want to use because that way they're better off and I'm worse off. The bank will always win on these transactions. If, on the other hand, I am going to sell US dollars and buy pounds, so I'm going in with my dollars, looking to buy pounds, the question then becomes, well, how many dollars is the bank going to charge me for each of the pounds that they're selling me? Are they going to want $1.6845 for each of those pounds, or are they going to want $1.6855 for each of those pounds? Again, if you can frame the question in those terms, you can answer it. The bank is going to want 1.6855, because that's the higher amount. That will leave me worst off, and it will give me fewer pounds. If all else fails, what you can do is get your calculator out and do the conversion using both rates. Whichever one gives you the worst result is the one you should use. 
So that's that's how to sort out the way round uh, the rates go and which one you need to use. There's some more terminology that's important here because again we have seen it in some past exam questions. When the spot rate moves what we talk about is one currency appreciating or strengthening and the other currency is depreciating or weakening. The important point to remember is here. An appreciating currency will buy more units of another currency which kind of makes sense when you think about it. So if I can buy more currency of another country for one unit of my own currency then it means that my currency is appreciating, it is becoming more valuable. So just to illustrate with this with some numbers, let's say we've got uh, our example where one pound buys $1.6845 and then we go back a year later and the exchange rate is one pound uh, is two dollars. That means that sterling has appreciated, sterling has gone up. Now that may seem a little bit counterintuitive because of this number going up may make it look like the dollar's more expensive and sterling's cheaper, but that's not correct. That sterling will now buy more dollars. So sterling has appreciated. Sterling has become more valuable. It will take you more dollars to buy one pound. If, on the other hand, the exchange rate a year later was one pound equals one dollar fifty, sterling has depreciated. So as previously, you could buy $1.68 for each of your pounds, you can now only buy $1.50. So sterling has become less valuable and one pound will buy fewer dollars. Now spot rates fluctuate all the time and this is due to a number of factors. Probably the biggest single factor is speculation. There are trillions, literally trillions of dollars worth of foreign currency traded every day around the world. There are huge amounts of uh, money controlled by investors, hedge funds, uh, speculators, institutions who are looking to make money on these markets. And the expectations of speculators tend to be self-fulfilling. If the speculators think a currency is going to go up, they buy it, that increases demand for the currency and it goes up. If the speculators think it will go down, they sell it, that reduces demand uh, and it goes down. So that is hugely important. They're also influenced by the balance of payments over the longer term at least. So a country, uh, in order to import goods, needs to uh, buy foreign currency. That will increase the demand for foreign currency. They're influenced by government policy. Uh, there's various ways uh, that you may have covered in economics that governments can influence the exchange rate. And the two we're going to focus on for the purposes of this paper are inflation rates and interest rates, because it is possible to actually calculate at least the theoretical impact that different inflation and interest rates will have on currencies using a couple of formulae and you may be called on to do these calculations in the exam. Now the theory of purchasing power parity calculates future spot rates based on the different inflation rates in each country. So there's some theory behind this that says that the exchange rate between two currencies should be in equilibrium, in other words it will reach its right level when the purchasing power of each currency is the same in each country. In other words you can buy the same thing in the UK and the Eurozone with the same amount of money. Now this is a theory and there's a huge amount of literature and economics devoted to whether this works or not, what the limitations are and so forth, uh, but you don't need to know that for this paper. For our paper you just need to be aware that that is the theory. And what follows from that, if the theory holds, is that you can calculate future spot rates based on changes in relative prices in those two countries, in other words the inflation rate. Now the formula is set out here so your spot rate between A dollar and B dollar are, are two currencies here. Bear in mind the way this is quoted means that one unit of A dollar equals a certain number of units of B dollar. So we're looking at how many B dollar does it take to buy one A dollar. The way you'll work that out is by multiplying the spot rate by one plus the inflation rate in country B, so you're going to take the second one that's quoted there, divided by 
the inflation rate in country A. So you'll take the first one quoted there. Let's do a numerical example just to illustrate how that works using some real numbers in real countries. So let's say that we've got inflation in the UK at 3% and Europe at 6% and we've got a spot rate it costs 66 pence, 0.66 pounds to buy one euro. So what's going to be the spot rate one year from now? Well, if the spot rate now is 0.66 pounds, then we're going to have to multiply that by 1 plus the rate of inflation in the UK divided by 1 plus the rate of inflation in the Eurozone. And the reason it's going to be that way around, remember, is that one euro is 0.66 pounds, so we're going to take the second one in our quotation, put that on top of our calculation, we take the first one in our quotation, put it on the bottom of our calculation. You will also come across this calculation in F3, so you'll have a couple of chances to remember it. If we work through that calculation, it is 0.66 times 1.03, 1, 1 plus the inflation rate in the UK, divided by 1.06, 1 plus the euro inflation rate, gives you 0.6413. So the spot rate we would predict a year from now, based on purchasing power parity, would be euro to pound 0.6413. So 0.6413 pounds will buy you one euro in one year's time. Now if we just think about what's happening here, because you could be called upon to explain that in an exam question, what this is saying is that in one year's time, you will need 3% more pounds to buy the same product, but you will need 6% more euros. So prices uh, in Europe going up at a faster rate than prices in the UK. What that means is that sterling is going to appreciate. Sterling is actually going to become more valuable relative to the euro. And that's what we're seeing happening in our calculation. Sterling has appreciated to the point where you don't need uh, 66 pence to buy one euro. You now only need 64 pence to buy one euro. It's going up because inflation in the UK is lower. Now another theory that you'll need to be aware of is the theory of interest rate parity. And interest rate parity is used to calculate forward rates. It says that the difference between spot and forward rates uh, is predicted by the difference in interest rates between the two countries. Now you need to know the formula. It's, quite, it's possible that you'll be asked to use it. And it's very similar to the PPP formula. The forward rate, A dollar, B dollar, remember that's the number of B dollar that's equal to 1 A dollar is equivalent to the spot rate times 1 plus the interest rate in country B, and we're taking the second one, uh, divided by the 1 plus the interest rate in country A, taking the first one in our initial quotation. Now to see how that could be used and why that works, it's probably easiest to work through a numerical example. So let's go through the lecture example. We've got a UK company that's got seeing interest rates in the UK as being 4% and in the US as being 8%. They have a million pounds to invest for 12 months. We've got a spot rate of $1.90 equals one pound and they're risk averse. So if they're risk averse what that means is they are going to want to take out a forward contract to guarantee the amount of dollars that they will be able to convert back into pounds at the end of the contract. Now the question is, should they invest the £1 million or the, in the US or the UK? So let's work out how this investment will fare. Now if they decide to invest in the US, we've already seen that they will want to take out a forward contract. So using interest rate parity, we can work out the forward rate. We've already seen that the current rate, dollar sterling, the spot rate is $1.90 equals £1. So using IRP, we will multiply that by 1 plus the US interest rate, so that's 
divided by 1 plus the UK interest rate, which is 1.04. That means our forward rate in one year's time is going to be dollar sterling 1.9731. So, they, you'll need more dollars uh, to buy a pound in 12 months' time. The pound is uh, appreciating here. So what are the cash flows? Well, at the beginning, we have our £1 million, and we're going to sell it for dollars. Remember, our current rate is £1 equals $1.90, so that will give us inflow of $1.9 million to invest. We then invest it for one year at 8% interest. So the amount of interest we will receive is 8% of 1.9 million, that is 0.152 million. So at the end of those 12 months, we will get back $2.052 million. What we're going to do now is sell those dollars using our forward rate. So if we take our 2.052 million dollars and we divide it by our rate of 1.9731 that gives us 1.04 million pounds at the end of the year. Now you can probably see where this is going but let's just complete it off. If we decided to invest in the UK, we just take our £1 million and we invest it at a rate of 4%. So 4% of £1 million gives us £40,000, so at the end of that period we end up with £1.04 million. Now what this example illustrates is that should they invest in the US or the UK, well it doesn't make any difference. Assuming that interest rate parity holds, you can invest in whatever country you like and if you're using forward contracts to lock in your exchange rate at the end of the period, you will always come back to the same number. Now if interest rate parity did not hold, you would actually have an opportunity here for something called arbitrage. And arbitrage means taking advantage of anomalies in pricing. If interest rate parity did not hold, then it would potentially be possible perhaps to borrow in the UK at the cheaper rate of 4%, convert it into US dollars, invest in US dollars at a rate of 8%, get your 8% return, uh, at the end of the period repay your UK debt and make a profit without taking any risk. And that is known as arbitrage. So if, that, if it were possible to do that, then on the whole people would do it. And I won't go into the mechanism for this, but it's just worth being aware that by doing that, what speculators would be doing is bringing forward rates, rates more or less into line with what you would expect under interest rate parity. So on the whole, interest rate parity does hold. Just one final note on this. Unlike most of this section, this does overlap with F3 you may come across something called the Fisher effect and the Fisher effect looks at the link between interest rates and inflation rates. What it says is that the nominal rate of interest, the actual amount of interest that you receive or pay, is made up of two elements. It's made up firstly of an allowance for inflation and then the remainder, the bit that's not to do with inflation, is made up of something called the real rate of interest. So it's possible, uh, although not likely, that you'll see variants of this formula in the exam. Okay, so we've looked at why exchange rates move. It's time to start thinking about how organizations can control transaction risk. Just, just take a second to recap what transaction risk is. Transaction risk is when you have a receivable or a payable in another currency. And the risk to you is that in, in the time difference between the price being agreed for your sale or your purchase and the cash settlement of your receivable or payable, the exchange rate moves adversely. So the risk for you is that you have a receivable in a foreign currency 
and that currency depreciates. And therefore, when you come to actually get the cash, there is less than you're expecting. Conversely, if you have a payable in a foreign currency, there is a risk that the currency of, that the payable is in appreciates. So you end up having to settle more, having to pay more cash than you were expecting to. Now, transaction risk is very, very common because it affects any organization that either sells in a foreign currency or pays suppliers in a foreign currency. And that's why the controls over it are so important. Now, there are a number of controls that you can use without using capital markets. And one of the things you can do is simply invoice in your own currency. If the problem arises from having receivables in a foreign currency, well, why not not have receivables in a foreign currency? So if you're a UK company exporting to the US, why don't you perhaps invoice in sterling in that example? So you might invoice in sterling. That gets rid of your currency risk. You know exactly how much you're going to get in sterling. Well, why isn't that more popular? Well, quite simply, your customer isn't going to be too happy about that. What you are doing is transferring your risk to your customer because your customer is going to have to settle your bill by buying sterling. And your customer operates in US dollars. So they're going to be taking a transaction risk. Now what is possible is that your customer might say, OK, you can invoice me in sterling, but I want a discount. And in that example, you would actually be paying your customer to take on the risk for you. You'd be paying them in order to transfer risk. So that's possible, but it's not common practice. Another approach you might take is to match your receipts and payments. Leading and lagging is doing things with the timing of your receipts and payments. So let's say you have a payable in a foreign currency. Well, what you might do is perhaps settle it immediately. So you might settle your pay payables immediately. That way, there is no time gap for the currency to move between agreeing the price and settlement. You agree the price, you pay it, that's that. It's very effective, but obviously it can create cash flow issues. You'll then, you'll then suffer in terms of cash flow from paying immediately rather than taking the 60 days credit or whatever you're entitled to. If, on the other hand, you are a company that has inflows and outflows, in an overseas currency, then what you might do is have an overseas bank account and use that bank account to receive your inflows and to pay your outflows. That way you're not having to convert the foreign currency back into your own currency at each stage and you are not so exposed to fluctuations in the exchange rate. Although obviously if you do have a balance in that bank account at any point, you will be exposed to translation risk. And then finally, if you are a group of companies, perhaps which trade all over the world in all different currencies, what you might do is net off any intercompany balances and look simply at the overall net exposure that you have as a group to any foreign currencies, which is probably going to be less than the exposure of any individual company. Now these are worth being aware of and they're worth considering if you are dealing with a question about a, an organization that's facing transaction risk. However, do think about whether they are appropriate for the company that you're dealing with and it is very unusual to see questions set in any detail that deal with these techniques. Now as well as the internal controls, there are four techniques that are examinable in this paper that are external. They use capital markets. And we're going to look at two of them in this chapter. So the first technique we're going to look at for managing transaction risk is probably also the most common and that's a forward contract. Now we've already seen what a forward contract is. It's a commitment to buy or sell a fixed quantity of something at a fixed future date at a predetermined price. So this can be applied to currencies. You can make a deal to buy or sell a certain amount of currency at a certain date at a certain price. Forward currency contracts are offered by banks all around the world and as we've seen they calculate their forward rates using interest rate parity. 
Now, it's pretty common in exam questions for you to have to discuss, one way or another, the pros and cons of the different techniques for managing transaction risk. So you need to be familiar with these, and also able to apply them to the circumstances of any scenario you might be given. So what's good about forward contracts? Well, they're transacted over the counter, and what this means is that they are bespoke products. So the bank will tailor your forward contracts to exactly what you need. They will do it in exactly the currency you need. Uh, so if you want uh, South African Rand, they'll do that for you, uh, even though perhaps uh, there aren't exchange-traded products relating to that currency. They'll also tailor it to exactly the time period that you want and exactly the amount that you want. So it will fit your needs exactly. In other words, you have flexible amounts and you have flexible delivery periods. They do tend to be less than two years because after that time they get a bit expensive. So forwards don't tend to be used for long-term commitments, but certainly for short-term commitments and most uh, transaction risk arising out of trading will fall into that category. Uh, they, are, uh, they are very effective. So the disadvantages, well, they are unregulated. So unlike the exchange-traded tools that we'll see later on, there is no regulator to appeal to if things go wrong. You're kind of on your own. They are also contractual obligations. In other words, you must go through with your forward contract. This is the case even if you have some sort of default. So let's say that I sell goods to my US customer. I'm expecting a dollar receipt in three months' time. I take out a forward contract to cover that dollar receipt, and then my customer defaults on me. They don't pay the $5 million for whatever reason. I've still got to go through the forward contract under those circumstances, and it's possible that I'll lose money on it. So there isn't any flexibility in terms of honoring the contract on the date that you've agreed. Let's do a quick, quick example to illustrate how this could work in practice. So I've sold goods to my US customer for $5 million on three months credit. Go to my bank and say, I'm expecting these dollars in. Can you quote me a forward rate for three months' time? And the bank has said, we will quote you a rate of $1.677 to the pound. So how much is the sterling receipt that I can guarantee? Well, I know that that $5 million is going to get converted at a rate of 1.6777. So I am going to be receiving 2,980,270 pounds. So that's the amount of the receipt that I'm going to get. Assuming, as we've said before, nothing goes wrong in terms of the payment from my customer. Now, sometimes in the exam, you might be given uh, the forward rate directly, as you were in the previous lecture example. However, at other times, you may actually have to calculate what the forward rate is by being given either a discount or a premium uh, to adjust the spot rate. Now, there's two things to remember about discounts and premiums. You add a discount and you subtract a premium. So that's one way of remembering what you do with your discount and premium. You add a discount, you subtract a premium. The other way of thinking about uh, what you do with your uh, discount or premium is that it will always widen the bid offer spread. In other words, it will make the difference between the buying and the selling price wider. The reason for that is because when the bank Go, enters into a forward contract, they are taking a risk. They're effectively taking a bit of a gamble on what exchange rates are going to be in the future. Now, they have their own internal ways of hedging that risk, of course, but they do want a bit of extra fee, a bit of extra money, in return for taking that risk. So the way they will collect that extra money is by widening the bid offer spread. So let's run through an example of how, how that can work with some numbers. We're given spot rates between uh, dollar euro and dollar sterling. We've got a three month forward adjustment for uh, dollar euro of 0.16 to 0.12 cents premium. And for uh, sterling dollar, we've got an adjustment that is a discount. So let's calculate what our forward contract rate is going to be. Now, for dollar euro, we have a spot rate. that is 0 0.8488 to 0 0.8493. So the spread, we just want to check that, 
here is 5 what's called basis points. It's 0.0005, the currency that is referred to as 5 basis points. We then have a premium of 0.16 cents. So in terms of uh, dollars, that's going to be 0.0016 to 0.0012. So that's a premium, remember, so we are going to subtract it from our spot rate. If we subtract that, we end up with a forward rate of 0.8472 to 0.8472. Now just to check that we've done that the right way round, we can work out what the spread is now between our bid and offer rate and the difference between 0.8472 and 0.8481 is 9 basis points. In other words, the spread has widened, so that shows we've done the calculation the right way around. If we look at dollar sterling, we've been given a spot rate of 1.6 6845 to 1.6855 that is a spread of 10 basis points. We've then been told there is a discount of 0.08 to 0.17 cents so 0.0008 to 0.0017 it's a discount so we're going to add that onto our spot rate. So adding that on gives us 1.6853 to 1.6872. What's our spread now? The difference between 1.6853 and 1.6872 gives us 19 basis points. In other words, the spread has widened and that shows that we've done it the right way around. So it's a pretty simple calculation, just a couple of straightforward rules to remember, and for a couple of marks you may be asked to do this. Just one final note on forward contracts. It is possible that you'll see mention of something called a forward option contract. Now a forward option contract is exactly the same as a forward contract, except there's a choice of the dates you can exercise it on. Uh, the the cal calculations can get quite complex, you won't be asked to do those. Just to mention, this is not the same thing as currency options, which we'll look at in the next chapter. Now the next technique we're going to look at is called a money market hedge. And this is also known as a synthetic forward. It's basically a way of doing a do-it-yourself forward. It acts in a very similar way to a forward contract, but rather than going to your bank and getting the forward contract and have the bank set it all up, you can set it all up yourself. Now there is a process to doing this, but it's probably easiest to illustrate this with the numbers. So let's work through the lecture example. So in this lecture example, we're given a little bit of background about a company, Export PLC, that has won a contract that will result in the receipt of $2 million in three months' time. And we're going to work through how they can use a money market hedge to deal with transaction risk. Just to be clear, remember what the risk is. You have a receipt of $2 million. You have a risk that the dollar will fall during those three months, and therefore you end up receiving less cash than you expected when you agreed a price for the contract. Now, the easiest way to set these up is to use a box format. And you start off, for reasons that will become clear, with the bottom line which is what is going to happen in three months time. Okay. So what we want is in three months time we want to end up with a two million dollar liability. Okay. We want to have a two million dollar liability or loan. When we then receive the two million dollars from our customer we will use that two million dollars to repay our liability. Okay, bear with me and you'll see why we do this. Now if we want to create a two million dollar liability in three months time, we are going to want to borrow some money now. 
in dollars. How much do we want to borrow? Well, we can calculate that using the interest rates that we're given. We're told that the interest rate for borrowing in the US is 5%. Okay, so we're going to be borrowing at an annual rate of 5%. Now, we are told here that is the annual interest rate. And in fact, if you're not told that specifically, you can assume that any interest rates you are given are quoted annually, unless it's specified otherwise. So we've got an annual rate of 5%. However, we're not borrowing for a year. We're only borrowing for three months. So what we need to do is convert that annual rate of 5% into a three-month rate. Now, if you were doing this precisely, uh, you would go through the fourth route and so forth. But for these purposes, for these exam purposes, and in fact for most practical purposes, you're going to take an approach that's much simpler. We're going to take our 5% rate and divide it by 4. And that way, convert it into a three-month rate. 5% divided by 4 gives us 1.25%. So, in order to calculate how much we want to borrow now to give us $2 million debt in three months' time, we need to discount that $2 million by 1.25%. In other words, we will calculate $2 million divided by 1.0125. That's the discounting calculation we'll use. So, that means we want to borrow now, it's the top line of our box, we want to borrow $1,975,309. Okay, and that way, with the interest rolled up, it will be worth $2 million in three months' time. So what are we going to do with this $1,975,309 once we borrowed it? It's just sitting in our bank account. Well, what we're going to do is we are going to convert it into sterling. And this is how we are going to guarantee the amount of money we get in sterling. We're going to convert it now using the current spot rate. So the current spot rate that we have is 1.6845 to 1.6855 to the pound. And we need to work through which of those rates we're going to use. Well, what's the transaction here? We are selling dollars in order to buy sterling. So we're selling dollars to buy sterling. We're going to the bank saying what rate will it give us to sell dollars. Will the bank charge us $1.6845 for each of our pounds or $1.6855 for each of our pounds? Well, if you can pose the question that way, you can appreciate that the bank, because the bank always wins, is going to charge us the higher amount. They're going to charge us one68 five five dollars for each of those pounds. So we convert our money, we convert our dollars to sterling at a rate of 1.6855. That is going to give us a sterling amount now of one million one hundred and seventy one thousand nine hundred and forty two pounds. We've now got that money in our bank account. What are we going to do with it? Well, we're going to put it on deposit. Because what we want is to guarantee the amount of money we're going to get in three months' time. How much interest are we going to get for that? Well, if we look at our interest rates, our lending interest rate in the UK is 8%. Now, again, that's our annual rate. So we're going to need to convert it into our three-month rate by dividing it by 4. So 8% divided by 4 gives us a 3-month rate of 2%. So when we put this money on deposit, we are going to need to compound it using a rate of 2% to work out how much money we're going to have in 3 months' time. So if we multiply that by 1.02, which is compounding it by 2%, that means that in 3 months' time, we are going to have in our bank account 1 million 195,381 pounds. So, what happens at the end of three months? Well, we get the money from our customer. We get the $2 million that we're owed. The $2 million that we receive will be used to pay off our liability 
and that will leave us just with the £1,195,381 in our bank account. But what's so good about this is that we know now that in three months' time we will have £1,195,381 in exchange for those $2 million. In other words, what we've done is we've eliminated transaction risk. Now the effect of this is pretty much the same as a forward contract. And the operation of it is actually quite similar to a forward contract because when you take out a forward contract, this is more or less what the bank does. The difference is that the bank does this on a much bigger scale than any individual company. So one of the disadvantages of money market hedges is that they are usually more expensive. There are usually higher transaction costs involved in a money market hedge than there are in a forward contract because you're not using the bank and their economies of scale. However, one of the good things about a money market hedge is it is a little bit more flexible about timing. As we've seen with a forward contract, if you don't have the money on the day, then you still have to go through with the forward contract on the date you agreed. With a money market hedge, let's say our customer delayed payment for a few weeks. Well, with a money market hedge, it wouldn't be quite so serious. We could probably roll over our loan and roll over our deposit, and we would still more or less have our hedge in place. With a forward contract, we'd have to go through and honour our deal with the bank. Now, if, on the other hand, you face transaction risk for a payment that you're making to a supplier, you can go through a similar process, but you need to think about it the other way around. You need to end up with an amount of money in the bank rather than with a liability. Have a go at doing this one yourself. We've got some similar calculations in the next lecture example, but where you have an amount due to be paid and you want to eliminate the transaction risk. See if you can work through the calculations and press play when you're ready to debrief it. So let's debrief this lecture example where we're trying to deal with transaction risk on a payment that we're making. Now the format, our pro forma, is going to be very similar. In three months time, when the transaction actually happens, is our bottom line and now is going to be our top line. We have an amount due to be paid of $2 million in three months time. So what we need to end up with is a $2 million asset. So we want to have $2 million in the bank at the end of those three months that we can use to settle our payment. How are we going to get that asset? Well, we're going to have to put some money on deposit now. How much? Well, in order to work out how much, we're going to have to discount our $2 million back using the lending rate in the US. And we're told the lending rate in the US is 4%. So, converting that into a quarterly rate, 4% divided by 4 gives us a quarterly rate of 1%. So, discounting back our $2 million by 1%, so divided by 1.01, .01, means that the amount of money we need to put on deposit now is $1,980,118. Where are we going to get those, uh, those dollars from? Well, we're going to borrow some money in the UK and convert it into dollars. How much do we need to borrow in the UK? Well, we'll need to work that out using the spot rate. So which spot rate are we going to use in this transaction? Remember what we're going to be doing here. We are going to be selling pounds and buying dollars. So we sell our pounds uh, by our dollars. What rate is the bank going to give us? Well, what rate are they going to sell dollars to us at? Are they going to sell us dollars at a rate of 1.6845 for each of our pounds? Or are they going to give us 1.6855 for each of our pounds? The bank always wins, remember, so they're going to give us less. They're going to give us fewer dollars for each of our pounds. So they're going to give us 1.6845 dollars for each of our pounds. So converting 
our dollar amount at a rate of 1.6845 gives us the dollar amount that we need to borrow. And that works out at being 1,172,000 541 pounds. So that's the amount we're going to borrow. At the end of three months there'll be some interest accrued on that borrowing. How much? Well the interest rate in the UK for borrowing is 9% per year. Converting that into a three-month rate we're going to have 9% divided by 4 and that gives us a rate of 2.25%. So we are going to compound this amount at a rate of 2.25%, so multiply it by 1.0225, and that means that in three months' time we are going to have a liability of 1,201,991. £991. That's going to be our liability. At the end of three months, we use that $2 million to pay our bill, to pay our supplier, and that leaves us with a liability of £1,201,991. In other words, we have certainty now about how much that $2 million is going to cost us. In other words, we have eliminated transaction risk again. Now, I will just say the calculation may seem a little bit complicated, but as you do more practice, you will get used to these. And at the end of the day, there are only three calculations here. You have one, two, three calculations. You've got two compounding discounting calculations and one currency conversion. So once you're used to them, they're not too difficult to work through. So just to recap what we've covered in this chapter, we looked at exchange rates, how they're quoted, and some of the key terminology around them. In particular, it's very important to be aware the spot rate is the price for delivery today. The forward rate is the price for future delivery of a given currency. We looked briefly at the reasons why the spot rate moves, and in particular focused in a little bit on inflation and interest rates and some of the calculations that go along with those theories. We then started to look at controls over transaction risk. Now, this is referred to as hedging. A hedge is a transaction you enter into in order to reduce risk in some way. There are some uh, techniques that don't use capital markets, such as netting off intercompany balances or leading and lagging. And then you have forward contracts and money market hedges that do, to some extent, use other parties and capital markets. We looked at a forward contract, which, remember, is usually with your bank. And a forward contract is when you agree with your bank the rate that will apply at some point in the future for a specified amount of currency. And a variant on this, a forward option contract, gives you a little bit of flexibility on dates. Or you can use a money market hedge, which is sometimes called a synthetic forward or DIY forward, which has an action very similar to a forward contract, but you set up the transactions yourself and you use interest rate parity, uh, you use the series of transactions to create a fixed rate that you're, is going to apply in the future to a receipt or a payment and therefore you get rid of transaction risk.